what does a pendulum do? So we're going to look at an undamped pendulum. But what would a pen damped pendulum be? Well, it may have wind resistance. You might be swinging the, the pendulum through some viscous liquid, like through oil or something. Then you might have a damped system. And there's ways to write that down, but we're going to do an undamped. So just we're in the vacuum of space, right? And um, we have the gravity of the moon, maybe. And we're just going to let our pendulum go, all right? There's no wind resistance. So let's imagine it's on a frictionless, it's on a frictionless pivot. What's, what's that pendulum going to do? Well, let's draw a picture. Um, the pendulum is going to be pivoting around some point. Um, it's going to be, it has some length, right? So our pendulum has got, it's an arm. And at the end of that arm, it's got a mass. So let's assume that this part is massless, all right? It's a very thin material, has almost no mass. So really, all the mass is concentrated at the end, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a vertical line here just for reference. And what we're going to do is we're going to call this angle here, we're going to call that y. So whereas in the last picture, y represented the position, here it's representing the angle. Okay. So what's going on? What's driving this pendulum's motion? Well, the thing that's driving this motion is gravity. All right. Gravity, as I pull this pendulum up and I let go, there's no spring, right, pulling, but there is the force of gravity that's going to make it swing, right? So gravity is pulling down, okay? So let's say uh, gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared, okay? Now, how do I find out how that gravity is influencing the system? Well, I need to know, I know when the pendulum swings, it's going to go this way, right? It's going to, and then right here, it's going to be moving tangent to that arc that I just drew. So what I need to know is how much is the gravity pointing in this direction. So what I have here is I have a right triangle. And I've got to determine what part, how much of this vector is pointing tangential to that arc. Okay. Well, how would I get that? Well, we have this angle Y. That's the same as this angle here. This and this are the same. I would write a Y in there, but it's getting a little crowded. All right. So this angle and this angle are the same. You can see that by just doing a little bit of geometry. So that's not my y. I was wrong about that. Let's use a double arc there. And we'll use the single arc, same as this one. That's my y over here. This is my y. Because this is parallel and these are parallel. So this angle must be the same. All right. So this is my y. Um, so if I want this vector here, uh, the length of it is just going to be um, the, uh, g times the sine of y. Maybe I can fit y in there. There we go. So this vector is g times the sine of y, the magnitude of that. So that's the amount of force that m is experiencing here. Okay. Um, now, we also know that it has, uh, that's the potential force, right? The gravity is supplying that. But it also has force due to its motion. And that's always mass times acceleration. Okay, so how do I get the acceleration of this? Well, it's moving on a circular arc, right? The radius is staying the same because this pendulum has a fixed radius. So if I want to know the position along a circular arc, that's arc length. Now, arc length for a circle, if you, if you remember, is uh, the radius times the angle if we measure the angle in radians. Okay. So if I want the rate at which it's moving or the acceleration along this direction, I'm just going to differentiate that. Okay, so I have the, the radius times the angle. That's how I measure arc. I'm going to take two derivatives of that. L is a constant, so it doesn't get affected. So this is my acceleration. This is my angular acceleration. But this, this oh, actually, y is my angular acceleration, and this is my proper acceleration. Multiply that by m, and I get my force. Now, that has to balance. I mean, where does that force come from? Well, it comes from this, right? So that has to be uh, the acceleration here times the mass. So that's going to be mg sine 
of y. Okay, um, and I think because g is positive, and I can see that my angle is actually going to be decreasing when I move in this direction, I really need a negative here. If I took a negative g, I wouldn't need the minus sign, but I happened to write it down without one, so there we go. So here we have um, a differential equation, and we can solve this, right? We can. Um, get this in the form that we need by dividing through by ml, all right? So I get um, minus g over l sine y, right? And um, let's put it into our phase plane picture. So we're gonna get some v's in here. So that's gonna be dv dy times v um, equals negative g over l sine y, okay? And um, let's go ahead and anti-differentiate, right? So go ahead and do that. Pause the video. Three, two, one. And you should have gotten this. One half v squared equals, well, what's happening here? Well, uh, the antiderivative is going to be g over l cosine y uh, plus a constant. Okay. Now, what does this look like? Okay, let's, let's go to a graphing program and graph this guy. Okay, so here's the picture. Here's what's going on. Uh, I've chosen a value for a constant c. I just set it equal to zero, okay? Uh, that would correspond to some configuration, all right? It actually has to do with the initial velocity, all right? When I swing this pendulum, um, I can push it. Right? I don't just have to let it drop. All right? C has to do with how hard I push it. All right? So I'm setting C to be zero. You can figure out, does that mean it's actually zero velocity? Uh, I don't know. We'd have to look closer at the equation. I don't know that C is the velocity, but it has to do with the velocity. All right? So I'm just saying I'm pushing with some velocity here. All right? That's, and it happens to correspond to C equals zero. And this is the picture that I get. So what's happening? Well, here, if I start here, uh, my angle, it looks like it's uh, pi over 2, right? So I'm hold, holding it horizontally. Maybe I get a little push, not sure, but it goes. It starts swinging. So what happens to the angle? The angle um, is um, going to decrease, right? And the velocity being in the downward direction is going to become negative. So the angle goes down, 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 down to zero. Now remember, I'm measuring the angle from the vertical, so it's just got to here, all right? And then the angle becomes negative, all right? So now it's coming up like this, okay? So now, what happens now? Well, it's gonna keep going. Now the angle's gonna start decreasing again. Now the velocity is positive because it's swinging the other direction, right? Now it's swinging the other direction. It's vertical again. Now it's still going to that direction, so the velocity is positive, 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 positive. And then the process starts over again. And it swings down over to here. I'm trying to get away from the camera <laughs> and also point at my thing. And then it starts swinging down again, vertical. And then over to here. And then down, vertical over there, and then down. <laughs> this is like patting your head and rubbing your tummy. It's really hard. <laughs> and then back to, you know, back to where we started. Okay, so it's just, it's just swinging back and forth like this, and we're just going around and around in the phase plane on this ellipse. Okay, and depending on how much velocity I impart on the system, I'm gonna get a different size ellipse. And that ellipse, remember the size of the ellipse has to do with the energy in the system, all right? These are, uh, and so I, I get, um, and I also have different starting angles. Here's, I'm just starting it with a very short angle, all right? And uh, if I change the velocity and things, you might get these ellipses to change, you know, height and width and things like that. If you want more velocity and, and start it with just a small, small angle, you could, you could affect that by changing some of these constants around. Okay, so 
Uh, but what, what's really interesting here is what happens when I push this out to here. Look at this. Now what's happening? Think about this. What is this describing? Well, let's take a look. Um, uh, boy, uh, my angle is just going, right? It's just going and going and going. It's never, um, I mean, it, it starts at zero and then it goes to two pi, right? I come all the way along and come back to two pi. So what does that mean? That means that I went all the way around, right? That's what's happening here. Now, I, the pendulum has been pushed with such velocity that it's actually going whoop and then coming back down and then going whoop and then coming back down and whoop and coming back down. So it's, it's not rocking back and forth. It's just spinning, right? And that's why the angle just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, right? It never turns around and makes the angle get less. We just travel along one of these trajectories. Okay. We can either start by shoving it with a negative velocity, we can shove it downwards, or I could start by shoving it upwards. I could go uh, and push it around this way, right? And so that's the top curve. So one of those two things is happening, depending on which direction we start by shoving it, all right? Now there's one other interesting thing here, and that is if I position it right, let me see if I can get this. I think it's 1.96 is a good approximation. This, look at this guy. We actually get these points here. Now, um, what is happening at these points? That's right in between where the, the pendulum is swinging back and forth and when it's going around, all right? Those points, are when the pendulum, pendulum is exactly vertical. Okay, it's just sitting here like this. Now these are equilibrium points. If you start, th this is a solution, just a solution that's constantly equal to pi the whole time. And here it is, I'm showing you a picture. Here, I'm holding it in my hand, right? But this is an unstable equilibrium because unstable means if I give it even the slightest nudge, it's gonna go, right? If I give it just the tiniest little boop, it falls. So these are unstable. They, they, they become, they, they, you give them a slightest nudge and they go away. Um, whereas we were seeing stable equilibria when I had C over here. I can kind of see where they are. These are stable equilibrium positions the points that are in the center of these little ellipses. One is at zero, of course. This is stable. If I give it a nudge, it just comes back, right? It doesn't all of a sudden collapse and go to some other equilibrium, right? These are just staying where they are. If I put it at two pi, it's also stable. If I put it at four pi, it's also stable. So even multiples of pi give a stable equilibria, whereas the Odd multiples of pi are giving us unstable equilibria, where if I nudge it, all of a sudden I end up, I actually will be nudging it and have to impart a little bit of velocity and I'll end up on one of these or one of these, right? Um, I almost forgot to say this. The, this curve that goes between these uh, points of unstable equilibria this is called a separatrix. It sounds like a made up word, but it separates the phase plane into, into the two different types of behavior, this versus this. And that curve that was right in between is called the separatrix, all right? Um, I wanna point out there's one other thing that's important to realize. Uh, let me go to your book where they talk about this. They, they put down a number of um, important statements here, okay? Um, and they say it's a little bit difficult to prove these, and I, I think they're right, <laughs> but they're, they're totally believable. But um, one of them is down here, uh, statement four. 
uh, distinct trajectories can't intersect. All right. In other words, if you have two trajectories that intersect, they have to be identical. All right. Um, and so if we go back to the picture and look at this, um, it looks like I've got two trajectories, distinct trajectories intersecting here. Right. I got the one that's on the top which wants to be like this, and the one on the bottom, which wants to be like this, and it looks like they're crossing. So does this contradict what they're saying? Actually, what they're saying is, is telling us that if you were to move along this curve, it would take you an infinite amount of time to get to this point. And therefore, these actually are distinct. Because you can't actually cross over from this top curve to any of these other curves. So that statement in the book that the distinct trajectories can't cross is telling you that it takes an infinite amount of time to get here. Because if it took a finite amount of time, you would get from this trajectory to another one. But that's impossible. So what that's saying is that if I, um, if I start, if I get this, if I give it a little bit of a nudge so that it goes all the way up to where it would be at the top, it would take, to get all the way back up to that unstable equilibrium, it would take an infinite amount of time for it to get there. It would go slow, to slow down and slow down and slow down and slow down and slow down. It would never actually get there. I can push it so that it almost gets there and it'll rock back, right? And that's looking at this picture. Where did my dial go? That, uh, this. Or no, the rocking back is this one, right? That's where it almost gets there, but then it rocks back. Almost gets there, but rocks back. Or I can push it far enough that hard enough that it actually goes all, all and goes all the way around, right? It gets there, but it keeps going, right? But to be delicate enough to get it so that it actually makes it to the separatrix, um, you'd have to push it so that it, you could never actually get it to go there. You'd have to push it, and it would take an infinite amount of time for it to get up there. So you can never actually achieve that, right? So I just wanted to point that out. The separatrix is the is the curve that joins the unstable equilibria points and um, separates it into the oscillatory behavior versus the um, the the other behavior, right? The back and forth versus the the other kind. All right. So that's fun stuff. Um, and we, we will get to more of this stuff later in the book. I think chapter 6, chapter 3, chapter 6, we'll actually start getting to be able to solve these more explicitly. All right? But this just gives you a picture of um, uh, phase planes, which I think are really, really useful things. So I'll see you in the next video. All right?